All right. Okay. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. Assuming we're more or less on the on the same uh, uh, time zone. Yeah, that saxophone is a reminder to me that I should be doing um, something new in this lockdown. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's just sitting there. Um, but there you go. Okay. I'm going to try to share my screen so that we've got something to. Okay. And then uh, where are we? So I'm hoping you should see now a slide that says research for shark conservation in the Galapagos Marine Reserve. Yes, I think you can. Good. Okay. So um, really excited to be able to um, talk with you all today. I've seen a few names there that I recognize. So hi, guys. Um, obviously, some of this is uh, the reflection of your own work, too. Um, I'm a professor at the University of San Francisco de Quito, also one of the founding members of Migramar, along with Randall and Hector and, and, and other folks. Um, and I work for a couple of um, organizations here in Ecuador as well, that do work on both on the coast, um, but more importantly, in terms of this talk, uh, in the Galapagos Marine Reserve. But what we'll find uh, is that obviously Galapagos is not as isolated um, as we think about it to be um, when we think about you know, evolution and endemism. The marine, the marine environment in Galapagos is strongly linked to, to a lot of other areas. So just to situate ourselves, um, this is uh, an area called the Eastern Tropical Pacific, and I just wanted to show you that um, Galapagos is not alone. Um, it's an island archipelago about 1,000 kilometers off the coast of uh, mainland Ecuador, um, but it's one of several oceanic archipelagos in the region. So um, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but uh, so this is Galapagos here, and, and surrounding it is this huge marine reserve. It, I think it was the second largest in the world when it was created, but of course that was 20 years ago. We, we have a lot larger uh, marine protected areas nowadays. Um, this is Cocos Island as well, one of the other loves of my life, um, with um, actually has a, a circular marine reserve around it, but there's um, this um, sustainable management initiative that's, that's kind of extending it out into this area of seamounts, which we'll talk about later. And then we've got Malpelo and Coiba too, and again, we're starting to see some, some protection in the, in the areas between them. And then we've got Clifton, which is a little dot in the middle of nowhere. It's the only coral atoll in the eastern tropical Pacific. Uh, the Revieja Islands, which have just been expanded to form a big protected box around them, and then even further up towards Guadalupe. So um, the colleagues that I work with kind of scattered around this entire region, spanning over 5,000 kilometers of ocean. Um, and this area here in green just shows the EEZ. So every, every um, uh, maritime country has um, the right to claim sovereign rights of the resources up to 200 nautical miles offshore. Uh, and so, obviously, Ecuador has a huge EEZ because um, we have 200 nautical miles off, off Galapagos. So that's that's all Ecuador's, and this chunk is too. And then we have Colombia's and uh, Costa Rica, which obviously also claims um, part of uh, the, the 200 nautical miles around Cocos. This area is, is highlighted because uh, back in 2003 or 2004, um, the four countries that, that own that area, should we say, so Panama, Costa Rica, Colombia, and Ecuador, created this this thing called the the, the seascape um, along with the Conservation International. And the idea was to protect the resources in the seascape and promote sustainable development of, of coastal resources. And it was within that initiative that a lot of our research began, um, but you'll see we've kind of landed on something quite tangible at the, at, at the end of it. So it's also a pretty cool area in terms of oceanography. Um, it's home to one of the most um, visual oceanographic features on the planet, you can see this from space, um, it's this equatorial front, as you can see along here, uh, which is essentially, it's as two currents shear past each other, so you've got the south equatorial current moving uh, westwards and then the counter current moving north, and as they come past each other, they slide past, they create all these kind of in tropical instability waves that propagate down the front, and this is a really interesting area um, it's, it's a lot cooler than you'd expect along the equator because it's fed from below by the Cromwell current, which is a cold, highly productive current, um, and it tends to aggregate quite a lot of plankton too. So um, highly productive if you're out there, um, if you're a whale shark, say, and you, and, and you want to go and find some, some good place to eat. Um, 
Galapagos itself is, is affected by these two coastal currents. One is the Panama Bight, which brings warm water from the, from the north. It's sometimes called El Nino current. And then with the Peruvian Humboldt current from, from the south. And these are the currents that not only do they bring the different oceanographic features to the islands, but they also bring the species that colonize them in the first place. The fairly young islands, um, the, I, th I think the oldest Española is about um, six million years old, something like that. But they were, older islands that have kind of vanished so there's a kind of like a conveyor belt there's there's a big hot spot underneath it um and, and the islands are kind of formed and as the, as the plates move towards the coast they die and the new islands are formed so there are islands that are in perpetual motion it's absolutely fascinating and of course they're famous because of the galapagos tortoises right these giant tortoises um, we have several species one on each volcano isabella has several volcanoes so it has several species um, in fact, we recently discovered that there were two species on Santa Cruz Island, two independent um, colonizations, um, and, and no mixing between the two populations. It turns out we have two different species. So we often think about Galapagos as these, you know, islands, enchanted islands um, in the middle of the ocean where these strange creatures inhabit, such as these giant tortoises um, or, or marine guanas. Um, and of course, they're also the birthplace of evolution. And, and I can't stress this um, too much. I mean, really, um, Charles Darwin's voyage on the Beagle changed the way we see our place on this planet um, and, uh, and where we come from and where we're going to. So really quite, quite, quite profound, um, his observations uh, about how, how, how the, the, the wildlife on each island was different but similar um, and I, I think he wrote something along the lines that if, if they'd been completely different then he wouldn't have picked up on it the fact that there was different types of mockingbird on each island and different types of finch and uh, really you know why, why is it that they each seem to be adapted to, to, to the particular conditions on each island and so um, he was only on the island for, uh, for, for a while didn't visit them all um, and then once he returned to England in 1835 um, so he was in Galapagos in 1835, returned in England in 1836, and never left England again. Um, and really focused the next, you know, 20 years writing up the origin of the species. And, and, and it took him a long time, uh, partly because of the religious convictions of his wife. And, you know, he, I think he understood from, from early on how this would affect um, a, lot, a lot of the beliefs of, of those days. But anyway, um, so I, th I think they hold a special place in, in, in people's hearts. And one island in particular holds a special place in my heart, and that's the island of Darwin here in the image. Um, and Darwin never visited this island. This is the most, the northernmost island. It's, it's tiny, it's about one square kilometer. And just offshore, you can see the island in the background there. There's a platform, a, a coral, rocky platform that's fairly shallow. Um, and then there's this arch, which is absolutely stunning. Um, and as the sun sets, you know, and you see the, the, the sunset glowing through the arch, truly is a spectacular um, natural monument to, to Darwin to Galapagos. And it's quite fitting that if you get in the water underneath the arch, you rapidly realize that you are in one of the most treasured underwater locations on this planet. And I can't do it justice verbally so i'm just going to show you a brief clip of what it's like to jump into the water at darwin arch so i hope um, i hope the internet's going to hold up if not i'll have to describe it to you but it won't be the same so let's see so this is this is the arch can be quite rough and as you get in you'll find silky sharks swimming around you big schools of jacks and then hundreds literally hundreds of scalloped hammerhead sharks They'll come really close to you if you hold your breath. They're cleaned at the cleaning stations. And then it'll open up and this big whale shark will come through, you know, 12, 13, 14 meters, uh, all of them female. And, 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 and the fish just pass and they come through, they appear out of nowhere. And your mind plays tricks on you. You, you, you expect to hear some kind of rumbling. Um, truly a spectacular place. Um, you can see six or seven species of sharks at any um, at any given moment, or his uh, colleagues doing some tagging, which I'm sure you've um, you've all seen. Here's some uh, hammerhead tagging and some and some whale shark tagging as we're as we're there. So anyway, that's just a a, a glimpse of the of, of, of the, the, the sheer quantity of life and the diversity of life down there. But as a whole, 
you know, we asked ourselves, well, why is Galapagos so important for sharks? Galapagos, um, sharks have been protected in Galapagos since, since its creation as a marine reserve back in 98. Um, it is frequently voted one of the top places on the planet to dive with big marine megafauna. Um, and there are a number of reasons why, why it might be such a sharky place. So we have about 30, 33, 34 species, depends on, on your point of view. Um, the great hammerhead, for example, is, is, is on the list, but there's one report at Gordon Rocks back in 1967. So, you know, is that a fair species to have on your list? There's about 30, between 30 and 35 species. Um, and some of the most common ones are the, are the scalloped hammerheads, which are critically endangered, um, silky sharks, which are on CITES now because, um, because of overexploitation, and, you know, these elusive whale sharks. So why are they, why are they here? Um, and, and, and does the marine reserve actually provide a refuge for them, um, or are they just passing through? So there are several reasons why they might be there. They might be refuging um, from, from currents in the open ocean. Um, they might be foraging in areas where there's local, local high productivity or high abundance of food. Um, some of these species are very social, such as the hammerhead, so it may give them a focal area where they can carry out social interactions. Um, there's a reproduction um, component to that too. Um, here is a, a, an ultrasound we took with uh, Neil Hammerschlag up at Darwin a few years ago of a silky shark, and she has some um, little embryos developing in here. In fact, I think uh, every single silky shark we took was, was pregnant. Um, there are nursery grounds. We've just started discovering nursery grounds for endangered shark species in Galapagos. And finally, there's this issue of orientation, which is something that um, Alex mentioned earlier. Uh, Pete Kimley talked a lot about um, in some of his early research, how do sharks orient in the ocean? And, and we believe they can orient to geomagnetic fields. And of course, these are volcanic islands, and so they're gonna have a lot of geomagnetic features down there. And uh, these may provide pathways in the ocean for them to, for them to navigate. So all these, uh, and maybe in combination, could be the reasons why Galapagos is so important. And then why do we still have large populations? Well, probably because we're so remote. Um, you know, a lot of coastal areas or islands that are closer to mainland have just been fished out, um, you know, in, in the last 50, 60, 70 years. Um, and unfortunately, uh, despite the fact that Galapagos is a marine reserve, um, they're still under threat. Um, here's some photos, most of them Galapagos. This is actually from Cocos. In fact, this is Randall. Um, this is one of my first visits to Cocos about 10 years ago. And this is on the island. And you can see all that material um, is, is absolutely insane. Mountains of long line. Um, these are just you know, heaps upon heaps of buoys, um, crates upon crates upon crates of hooks. All that was, was taken from long lines drifting around the island. And so the, these islands, Galapagos and Cocos, are constantly under siege from uh, industrial fishers. Um, here's, uh, the, these, these photos are from Galapagos. Um, so this is a, 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 an industrial boat that was seized a few years ago uh, with sharks on board. They'd already had their fins removed. There's a pile of fins here. Um, these are some photos from back when I used to live in Galapagos. So this is about maybe 15 years ago. And this was someone trying to smuggle out um, fins uh, in, in, through the airport. And then this here is taken from um, a long line experimental study. Uh, again, while I lived in Galapagos and even now, um, over the years, there's a, there's a local fishing sector and every so often there's a push to allow long lining in Galapagos. And then it invariably ends up in a study and the study invariably shows that it's not a good idea. I think we've had four or five of these studies now. And, and it's just uh, long lining and, and, and shark conservation just don't really go hand in hand. I don't know how many more experiments we have to do to figure that out. Uh, anyway, um, Galapagos is also highly dynamic, not just spatially, because we have these two different currents. So we have a warm north and a cool west, um, but also over time. So um, I, love, I love this figure because um, it shows how we switched from El Nino to La Nina conditions uh, back in 1998. So the end of the, uh, about mid-1998 was the end of the last really strong El Nino event. Um, and, and up here you can see that um, this is a, a temperature of the, um, the Pacific Ocean, so Galapagos is kind of in, in this little box here. But as you can see, we're red hot. This is really warm waters, so no, no productivity. This is a productivity map, nothing going on. Um, at this point, the El Nino has been going on for several months, and anything that can migrate has gone, and anything that can't migrate has pretty much died of starvation. So this is pretty, 
pretty uh, rough conditions, especially for animals such as marine iguanas and flightless cormorants and penguins. Um, then two weeks later, um, conditions have switched. Um, that conveyor belt um, bringing the cool upwelling water is kicked back on, but it's turned into fifth or even sixth gear and is belting out productivity. So in a sense, we've gone from zero productivity to an overproduction, and this is allowing the animals to recover. So I think this is an encouraging story, um, especially as we think more about climate change and about building resilience. It, it, it would seem to me that Galapagos would have a certain amount of inherent resilience towards climate change, although that does not mean that it's not under threat from climate change, given that we expect these extreme El Nino events to happen more frequently and, and with greater intensity. But at least I think it gives you, it, it gives the island some kind of resilience. So given that, what are the trends? So um, we have a marine reserve that's uh, over 20 years old. And the typical question that I might get, or maybe the park director might get is, so how are your sharks doing? Um, and, and unfortunately the answer, in all honesty, has to be, I don't know, um, which is that I find it incredibly embarrassing that after 20 odd years, we really don't know if the Galapagos Marine Reserve is protecting its sharks properly. Um, but we can speak to it in a certain way. Um, there was a study um, done by a colleague of mine, Tessa Peñarera, a couple of years ago, whereby he interviewed dive guides who had dived in Galapagos 10, 20, 30, and 40 years ago, and asked them questions about their perceptions of sharks. And it was pretty consistent. They all felt that shark abundances had dropped um, since the 1980s. And so, in some species it had stabilized a little. Um, the whale shark hadn't really changed much, but, but in a lot of cases, the populations have dropped. And that's a concern. If you've got a protected area for 20 years, that's not what you would hope. We also know um, that uh, in Cocos Island, we share uh, you know, our populations. Um, thanks to the dive industry, um, people have been taking uh, records of what they've been seeing over the last 25 years, and hammerheads, for example, have been declining uh, by about 45%, uh, which is tragic, but not all that unexpected now that we know a little bit more about the hammerheads. So our research focuses on, on, on a number of species. Um, we're interested in the hammerhead shark because it's iconic. Um, it is on the logo of the, the Galapagos National Park. It brings in millions of dollars to tourism and it is critically endangered. Um, 20 years ago, it was least concerned. 10 years ago, it was endangered and now it's critically endangered. So whatever we're doing to protect it, it's not working. Um, the Galapagos shark is very interesting. Um, it's not endemic, um, although the name might suggest that, um, but it does seem, the genetic studies show that it does seem to have very discrete populations even within the island. The black tip shark is interesting because we appear to have a lot of juveniles. It seems to be a really productive nursery area for this species. Silky sharks, as I said, very heavily fished and they're on CITES. White tip reef shark, they're, a, they're a, we, what we believe to be a, a resident species. They, they don't tend to move much around the coast. And then the tiger shark is interesting because of the top predator. Um, if you've got a successful marine reserve, you might expect your tiger shark numbers to start growing. Um, these animals are coming back and, and, and they're being able to survive. And then finally, the whale shark, because the whale shark is just a mystery. Um, you know, it's the biggest fish in the ocean and we don't know much about it. We, we know a fair amount, but um, we still don't know much about its reproductive biology, especially in the region. So it's, it, it's, it's an animal that brings out a lot of questions. So how do we do our research? Um, well, a lot of our research is based on, on space, on where animals are and when they are. And then the next questions are the drivers. Why are they making these movements or why stop moving? What is triggering a movement? So it's, it, it's, it's first of all figuring out where they are and then, and then the why. Um, so we set up an array of underwater receivers. And these, um, these little things down here, looks about a, you know, like a two liter PVC bottle approximately, and this is filled with a little bit of a, a battery and some, and some hardware, and that just sits in the water and listens. So we, we, we'll deploy that on a mooring of some kind, um, and then it will just listen passively for signals emitted by ultrasonic tags, and we can put those ultrasonic tags on anything. I've put them on salmon smolts all the way up to adult whale sharks, and including turtles and tuna and, wha wha and sharks. So, and sharks. Um, so, um, we have about a hundred receiver stations um, spread throughout the region, all the way from Guadalupe down to down to the south of uh, Ecuador. In fact, and we're now installing some in Peru too, and along the coast. 
And um, between us all, um, we've tagged another, I think this is this is an older slide now because they were about 1,500 animals. So we, we can we can know when an animal was here, when it was there, and then we can speak to you know how it might have moved between the two based on based on the timing. Um, but we can also um, if they reside in a site, we can figure out whether they reside there year round, whether it's only seasonally, is it only in daytime, only at nighttime, is there some rhythm to its presence in a site? So there's a lot of information we can get out of these. Uh, how do we do the tagging? Um, sometimes we do external tagging, which you saw in that video where we can dive down with a pole spear. Um, I find that's not particularly um, useful in the long term because the tags will fall off. Um, so one of the other things we can do is um, do a small incision and, and insert the tag and then a couple of sutures. Um, this is actually what we did at Cocos uh, a couple of years ago with the silky shark. Um, we paste the tag in. And then what we can do is um, build up a residency index. And, and we can do this very simply. Uh, this just shows of the six, um, six or seven species that we've looked at over the years in Galapagos. If we take their track to be... The, from the moment we tag an animal to the moment we get the last detection, say, you know, a year later, and then we can look at, well, of that period, how many days was it detected? So if it was detected every day for that year, then its residency index will be one. If it was detected for 180 odd days, then the residency will be 0 0.5. And if it was detected for one day, then it'll be 0 0.0001. Okay, so it gives us an idea about how how much they stay in, in, in the reserve with some assumptions, right? Because these receivers aren't everywhere, so they could be in the reserve and we're just not detecting them. So this is a minimum estimate. And what we're finding is we can divide the sharks into three groups. Um, over here, we've got the white tip reef sharks, which are pretty much all year round. They're not going anywhere. They're highly resident. Then we've got the whale sharks. In fact, we, we used to think when we tagged whale sharks with these tags, that the tags would just fall off. We were getting nothing from them. It turns out that they just, they're just only there for a day or two. So these guys are just passing through. And then we have the others, you know, from the tigers, silkies, hammerheads, galapagos and black tip sharks. They're pretty resident, if you look at it, look at it about 0 0.2 to 0 0.4. So that's between 20 and 40% of their tracks. They're being detected at a receiver. So that means they're probably spending a lot longer than that inside the marine reserve. So for these animals, we would say, okay, so they're spending significant amount of time in the reserve. And that, that points to the fact that the reserve may then offer some kind of meaningful protection. Um, but it doesn't say to us where they are when they're not at a receiver. So one of the things we do is we use satellite tags. Here's a, a, a top-down view of a hammerhead we tagged uh, not long ago. Um, it's a tank that we attach to the dorsal fin, and then it's got an antenna. So when the shark is knifing at the surface, sends a signal to a satellite, and we can pinpoint it. And then we can track it a bit like you can track your car on your GPS or on your phone. Um, with whale sharks, we do the same. And you saw in the footage, we were, we were um, darting them. We stopped doing that because those tags actually act like lures behind the whale sharks. And... As you saw in the video, there's silky sharks and black tips and all sorts of other things there. So some of those tags would get bitten off within a day, and they're very expensive tags. So um, we, we're now using these fin mounts, and they're pretty pretty good. In fact, we're tracking a, a, a whale shark right now um, that we tagged back in September. So that's you know, six months um, plus, um, actually coming close to eight months now. Um, so that's pretty uh, pretty good for for a whale shark. Um, and with whale sharks, just wanted to say, Galapagos seems to be out there on the limb a little bit. Um, if you look at whale sharks globally, um, they tend to be these open water uh, nomads, if you like, but that they do aggregate um, at particular areas in a predictable fashion throughout uh, certain times of year around the world. They, they tend to be coastal areas, um, such as Ningaloo, Mozambique, um, yeah, all, all sorts of places, the Mexican Pacific as well, and Baja California, Qatar. Um, but if you look at this, the, the, the sex structure, um, in all cases, except for Galapagos, you've got both sexes, but a majority of males in the light blue, right? Um, I guess um, Thailand is about 50-50, but Galapagos is 99% females. Um, so it's, it's completely different to every other site that we know of. Not only that, um, but if we look here about the size structure, 
most of them are between four and eight meters. Most sites are between four and eight meters. These guys don't even mature to the eight and a half, nine meters. So these are immature animals, all these. They're not babies, right? The babies would be down here between, you know, one and one and three meters, but they're subadults. Um, subadults, mostly males. And in Galapagos, our average size is around 11 and a half meters. Um, and we get very little below, below 10. Every so often we'll get a small one. It's about six or seven. For us, that, that's small. So really something very unusual is happening in Galapagos. Uh, it's only females and they're only big. And so what's going on? You know, so we track them. Um, and what we're finding is that it's, um, they're, they're not really residing in the islands at all. So our acoustic data was telling us that. So that, that, that validates that. What they're doing is that they're, they're streaming past Darwin. So on a, on a good day in Darwin, you might have four whale shark encounters. And then the next day you'll have another four whale shark encounters, but they're different animals. They're not spending more than two days at the island. And then early on in the season in July, they're heading out west along that oceanic front, remember with those um, tropical instability waves, over 1500 kilometers, and then they'll turn around and come all the way back again, again, pass through on the way back, and head out and they'll end, end the year along the coast of um, mostly northern Peru, uh, southern Ecuador. So there's this migratory loop that we're seeing. Um, we haven't closed it yet because the tags don't last long enough into January, February for us to get them then coming back to Galapagos, you know, from the coast. So we're still working on that. And occasionally one will come up to Cocos as well. So this was, this is interesting. One went from Galapagos to Cocos and to Malpedo, kind of did a tour of World Heritage Sites. Um, a couple of years ago, I was contacted by a journalist who, who sent me this image um, of uh, the uh, Chinese fishing fleet. Um, and she said to me, look, this is where the fishing fleets are at the moment. Would you be concerned about it? Uh, well, as you can see, if you overlay that on our whale shark tracks, that might be concerned. That is exactly where our whale sharks are. Um, and so here's a problem. If we're protecting our, our, our species, inside our national waters but then they're leaving and they're, they're actually spatially overlapping with a fishing fleet that we know will keep them if they catch them so just a point of concern there to say the least so one of the theories was that they were pregnant um, and in fact there's even a meme about it in fact that's me in there i'm in a meme i've never been in a meme before so this is a, a meme that was out i'm not always pregnant but when i am i can carry up 300 pups the only pregnant whale shark that's ever been found was one that was landed in Taiwan about 25 years ago and she had 304, 305 pups so that makes her the most fecund of all sharks um, and, and, and they were all at different stages of development in fact um, some of them were so close to being born that they were kept in tanks uh, alive for several months um, and this photo here you can almost if you like make out the bumps so a lot of people very convinced that, that this was a, a, a reproductive migration and um, I, I guess I was one of them too. A lot of, a lot of us thought that these, these are the big pregnant females are coming to give birth somewhere along the way. And would they be giving birth at Darwin Island? Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't give birth at Darwin Island because there's too many other sharks there. I wouldn't be pupping baby, baby uh, whale sharks if I'm in an area surrounded with silky sharks and black tips and tigers and, and all sorts of other sharks. Um, but what about along this equatorial front? Maybe that, that loop that they do isn't for them to feed. Maybe it's they're pupping along the way and, and, they're, and, they're, and their babies are feeding. Because um, no one really knows much about uh, neonate whale sharks. Um, when we see them, they're already about three meters um, uh, long. So, so what about that early life stage? How can, we, how can we figure that out? Well, um, we got in contact with the um, Okinawa Aquarium and they have a, an underwater ultrasound system. And so we um, headed out with them and we've um, ultrasounded about, I think, 17 females now. Um, we've been able to detect the follicles in the, in, in, um, in the ovaries developing, but there's not one iota of evidence they're pregnant. So it's still a mystery. And uh, the jury's still out as to why these big females would march past Galapagos every year um, and why it's only females. So we're still working on this, um, but there's no answer yet. This is just a, I'm not sure that I'm gonna show you this. It's not very clear, but you can just make out there Rui um, running the ultrasound under the whale shark. And so this is a challenge, right? We're in 
three knots of water, 20 meters deep, um, you know, in a, one of the remotest locations on the planet, um, trying to uh, get a female to agree to be ultrasounded. So, so quite a challenge, but um, Rui and, and Kiyomi, uh, we're also taking blood and looking at the, at the seeing whether the hormonal levels can, can give us some indication. To, to, to move on to the hammerheads, though, um, what we found out is that the hammerheads tend to reside at uh, the, the two northernmost islands, Darwin and Wolf, for a large part of the year, mostly the cool season. So the numbers will start, from the big aggregation started around mid-June and they'll carry on until kind of February, March. But they're not there the whole day. Um, what they tend to be there, they tend to start building at dawn and then at dusk they'll, they'll start dissipating out as they go out into the open ocean to forage. And we've tracked them out there and so we can, we can figure out their behavior. They're not just in the, next, in the next bay. So they tend to be more solitary at night when they're out foraging and then these big aggregations during the day. And then between mid-February, March, the numbers start declining and that's when we track them all the way to Cocos. Uh, and um, they don't stay at Cocos. They seem to go to Cocos and they're detected there briefly and then they're gone. Um, and then they turn up again at Galapagos in July. So um, one of the theories is that they're heading towards um, those big embayments of Panama and Costa Rica to pup. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, they're stopping off at Cocos on the way because this is an underwater uh, chain of mountains that can help them navigate. Uh, again, the jury's still out on that, but it does make uh, a lot of sense. So, um, so we've received a fair amount of traction in this idea that, that sharks travel between Galapagos and Cocos. And I, and I talk about hammerheads, but I must say, these are not the only species that do that. And we've actually had green turtles that do the same. Um, we have a whale shark, uh, or, or two even. Um, we've had uh, Galapagos sharks and a silky shark. So um, tagging is very expensive. And so it's very hard to get enough animals to make a jump towards the population, but we have, a, a large number of species, but a small number of individuals of each species. So you're kind of building this anecdotal evidence. First it's one, then it's two, then it's ten, uh, and you start thinking, okay, there's something, there's something happening here. Um, this is this is a, an underwater highway, if you like. Um, and in fact, what we've uh, what we've seen, um, this is from uh, tracks from about 25 hammerheads, is that um, they they do spend a lot of time inside the marine reserve, as you can see in this map, but it, but they will leave and. There is this connectivity between uh, Galapagos and Cocos. Sometimes it's not all the way. There's some seamounts uh, along the way, so they'll go up there and come back. But they are utilizing this area between um, Galapagos and Cocos, and that 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 is a concern if they're moving between marine protected areas. But there's a large area that's not protected in the middle because that's where they'll get they'll be vulnerable to fishing. They're also incidentally using the these productive waters out west. And again, this is uh, areas where there's uh, quite a lot of uh, industrial tuna fishing. So it is a concern. They're not spending all the time in the marine reserve. The marine reserve is offering some protection, but perhaps not enough. Um, and then I should mention, this is the, the, the last hammerhead we tagged back in, back in November at Darwin. Uh, and she was really annoying because she basically skirted the outside of the border of the marine reserve um, and ended up moving around these two seamounts that are just outside the border of the marine reserve. But if you think about it, when we designed the Galapagos Marine Reserve, we didn't really know anything about animal movements. Um, and so it's quite logical that as we learn more about the animals we're trying to protect, we might modify our opinion of what the shape of the marine reserve should be like. Um, but anyway, to go back to, 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 to this gap in between Galapagos and Cocos, we've been building um, uh, building the case for protection um, and uh, just last just this week about I think it was two days ago on, on, on the 12th of May um, the Galapagos Cocos Swimway as we call it was uh, recognized as a hope spot by Mission Blue so we're very excited about that that does not imply any uh, jurisdictional or management change but it does place a global spotlight on the area and highlight it for its importance. Um, independently of that, um, a lot of uh, our organizations uh, through Nignamar and, and Pacifico are big supporters and obviously Crema and Fins Attached, my university and all, all our, um, uh, our, our collaborators have kind of been uh, building the case to, 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 to actually formally create this bilateral swimway between, uh, between Costa Rica and Ecuador. And so that is something that's, that's still underway um, and it's kind of moving forward uh, right now. I think the, the biological justification is there and there's been economic studies carried out, legal studies being carried out, and now we're in the 
um, I guess, uh, COVID permitting in the stage where conversations have to be started with um, um, different stakeholders about how we can move forward. Uh, incidentally, like I said, just for those of you who are at the beginning, um, uh, Randall, Alex and I are meant to be out there as we speak. Um, we were going to carry out a, a very important cruise. This is going to be the first um, research-only cruise between Galapagos and Cocos. Uh, we were going to go out there, um, uh, look at the pelagic assemblage out there, um, collect environmental DNA, tag some open water sharks. It's a big expedition planned. Uh, it was meant to leave on Sunday. Obviously, uh, with, with, with the lockdown, that's not happening now, right now. It's, it's been postponed to next year, but we're, we're still really excited about that. And um, if any of you are interested in, in supporting that in any way, um, I'm hoping that uh, Alex will give you details about how to contact us afterwards, um, because we really need to make the most of once we're out there and really be able to, um, to, to come back and get a big bang for our buck. Uh, one of the things I did also want to talk about though was, was the juveniles. So um, I mentioned earlier about how uh, the, the hammerheads could be migrating towards Cocos and then to pop on, on the mainland, and that may, that may be the case. Uh, but we recently discovered neonate hammerheads around the islands. This is uh, one of the first ones we found. Uh, we actually caught it by accident. It's in our it's in our black tip shark nursery ground, and we sat next there all the time for black tips. We never caught a hammerhead before, and we we used a different net. Uh, we used the beach sand, and, and here we go. We caught we caught a baby hammerhead, and, and we're now we're now catching them consistently. And we we've discovered that it's a fairly important area for 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 these for these little critters, and uh, these are obviously um, critically endangered. So um, if Galapagos is not only providing refuge for the adults, but also providing these little nursery sanctuaries for juveniles, and that's, that's wonderful news. Um, we do have a question though, um, you know, how do these two species, black tips and, 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 and hammerheads, coexist in a little bay? This is, this is the bay here, you can get some idea that's our boat. So, you know, it's, it's not very big. And so we set an array of receivers uh, and we've tagged the shark, so you can see a little hammerhead with a, with a tag on its back. Uh, and, and we were able to track the movements of the hammerheads and the black tips um, as they utilize the bay and, and look at whether there's some kind of partitioning uh, or whether they're competing. And so I've got some, uh, this is some work with uh, Sal Jorgensen that we did last year, and I've got some students working up that data as, as we speak. But it's fascinating um, the way and the, they use the area because a lot of it is, is, is in the center of the bay, which is why you just don't see them. Um, a lot of the work we do is with drones as well, but they're just too deep for the drone to, to, to capture. So I don't know whether this will work, but in case it does, let's see. It should show the movements of the hammerhead sharks in green dots and the black tip sharks. And this is this is only 24 hours. So you can see the hammerhead sharks really kind of hanging around that center part of the bay where the where the, 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 the black tip sharks are kind of a lot more, a lot a larger area, covering a larger area and getting really close up to the shore. So it looks like there's some some uh, spatial partitioning going on there. Uh, I'm gonna try and change screen now. Ah, there we go. So overall, um, it does seem like Galapagos is a hub. We've actually got connectivity demonstrated with Malpelo. Um, even with Clipperton, we've had a silky shark that's moved from Galapagos to Clipperton, back to Galapagos, back to Clipperton, back to Galapagos again. Uh, we recently had a Galapagos shark tagged over in River Yejijedos up here. Um, that, that, that moved out to Clinton and then came to Galapagos. Uh, we've got a, a, but the, the biggest connectivity regionally that we can see is these movements between the northern Galapagos Islands and Cocos. And, and, and that, that relationship between Darwin and Wolf and Cocos is even stronger than the relationship between Darwin and Wolf and the rest of the, of the Galapagos Islands. And so that's really where we wanted to focus our conservation efforts. Um, just wanted to add here that um, people often ask us, I actually had uh, just today uh, someone someone asked me you know how many sharks are in Galapagos and, and we don't know it's very hard for us to uh, to do population surveys without things like monitoring landings obviously we don't land uh, sharks in Galapagos so we have this app called um, Shark Count and that's really helping because we're getting dive guides and dive tourists to go out there they can be diving or they can be snorkeling there's two modes and they record all the megafauna they see. This was actually based on something that was developed uh, 
the, the, the concept of, uh, of using divers to, to count um, sharks and turtles was actually developed for Cocos Island with, with the undersea hunter guys. And we took that and we, we turned it into an app. And the idea is to not only use this to see trends over the year, but trends over decades and to be able to, to track our population. So this is something that we, that we launched a couple of years ago. And I would encourage any of you that are from Galapagos or that are planning to visit Galapagos, please use the app. Um, it's a way to give a little bit back. It's, it's free, but um, you're giving information while you're enjoying your dive or your snorkel. Um, and for those of you in these lockdown days who, who are a bit of a loss to, to what to do, um, we recently um, collaborated, both Randall and myself collaborated on this uh, um, module for Ocean School um, run by Dalhousie University. Uh, it's all free educational material, but it gives you a total immersive experience into our research. It's mostly focused on Cocos, but also this connectivity between Cocos and Galapagos. So I would encourage you to go in there, explore it. It's got 3D videos you can put on your headsets if, if, if you have them. It's got games you can play. What, and what's what, what I enjoy is that it actually has exercise where it's it's a uh, you, you can jump in the water, tag your animals, take data, and actually build the argument for increased protection. That is exactly what we do as scientists. So um, if you're interested in playing around with that, or if you have kids that are around maybe 15 to 20 years old, that, um, you know, thinking of going into biology or conservation, really, really useful material for you to get, get your teeth into. At the moment, it's in English and French, but I believe it's going to be in Spanish too. And then the next generation. Um, I, I'm a firm believer that um, we've pretty much messed up our planet um, and that it's our responsibility to uh, put it as right, put it right as much as we can, but to place our faith in, in the next generations. And so we've developed this little story called Martin the Hammerhead Shark, and it basically summarizes everything I've just talked about in the life of a single hammerhead who um, is born in the lagoon in San Cristola that I just showed you, and she grows up and she migrates to Cocos and she has adventures and mishaps along the way. And so we're, um, this book is available in English, and the idea is that people buy it in English and then we, and, and you're actually buying two because you, you pay for your English version and that covers a Spanish version, which we then uh, will uh, hoping to use, we're using them in Galapagos, but we're hoping to use them on the coast of Ecuador and Costa Rica. Uh, where there's a lot of work that still needs to be done with local communities. So, um, yeah, check out Marty the Hammerhead. And then, you know, th this is a never ending battle. Um, we had a couple of years ago a situation, a big foreign vessel, reefer vessel, entered Galapagos uh, with several thousand sharks on board, about 8,000 sharks, I believe it was. And people in Galapagos care about their sharks. These are photos. People took to the streets um, to protest. And, uh, and, and we need to to channel that, to harness that, and also to bring that 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 respect, that love of nature to, to mainland Ecuador as well. So um, that's uh, just kind of on a positive note. Um, and then just to kind of bring you up to date, there's a couple of things that are happening here on mainland. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, we were made aware of a study that, that showed from DNA samples that 60% uh, of the hammerhead shark fins found in Hong Kong markets are from this part of the world. So from Galapagos, Cocos. I'm not saying that they were caught inside the reserves, but as you saw, they leave the reserve. It's the same population. So, you know, this is a critically endangered species, and these fins are allowed to leave both countries under very little regulation. Uh, and it's, this is tragic. And then last week, uh, the, in, in Hong Kong, two big consignments, about 20, um, uh, 26 tons. Of, of, of shark fins were, were, were seized. Uh, these were both mostly um, thresher and silky sharks on CITES. And so there's a big investigation going on right now as to how this might have happened. But to be honest with you, Ecuador outside of Galapagos does permit sharks to be landed. You're not, you're not meant to target them, but if you happen to catch them, then they may be landed. And, and in that way, in that kind of loophole, um, we land over 200,000 sharks each year, which is absolutely tremendous. Um, and so it's quite possible that these 26 um, tons of fins, which came from about 38,000 sharks, were all caught perfectly legally. But it's also possible, uh, and, and that's this table. I'm not sure if you can see this. This is a table of, uh, of uh, the, the little uh, things in blue are uh, when Ecuadorian vessels were caught fishing in, in Colombian waters around Malpelo. 
if, if those vessels are not caught, then they can come back to Ecuador and they can just say, oh, you know, we caught them, you know, just offshore. And so in a sense, they're, they're laundering um, illegal shark uh, fishing by being able to land them. So it, it is a big problem. And Ecuador was given a go card by the European Union in terms of their fishing and IUU. And so Ecuador is trying to address this. It's just unfortunate that these, you know, we've had a kind of double whammy of bad news over the last couple of weeks, but I'm hoping it'll serve as a, as a wake up call uh, for, for the authorities here. And then just finally, you know, the, G the Galapagos Marine Reserve is not enough. Uh, I just wanted to go back to, to this shark here, this hammerhead that we tagged. In, in November, remember, she ended up at the seamounts out, outside uh, of, of San Cristobal, just outside the Marine Reserve. Well, this is a, this is a screenshot from a, an app that detects fishing vessels just taken last week. There's a fishing vessel sitting right there, just plowing up and down. So, and she's not, this, uh, this vessel is not doing anything illegal. This vessel is fishing, fishing outside the Marine Reserve. Uh, but if it catches sharks, that's fine. It's, it's bycatch. And so you can see how easily it is for our sharks to be picked off one by one or 10 by 10 on these long liners that, that aren't doing anything illegal. And, 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 and that just goes to show that the protection at the moment we have, um, it's, it's just not enough. So uh, on that note, just wanted to shout out to all, uh, to all the people that have kind of worked on this. It's impossible to get everyone on the same photo. So this is just some of the Migramada members from our last General Assembly. A couple of my students who have done some great work on the juvenile work um, in, in the bays. Uh, and uh, yeah, shout out to so many organizations that, that, that help us with our work. And uh, that's it. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them out. Thanks so much, uh, Alex. There are some questions um, <coughs> that uh, uh, were posed. Um, Cable asks, completely understand the need to tag and track, but is there any research to determine what, if any, damage the bolted on fin tags cause to the shark? The shark fin grows, right? Yeah. So does the tag hinder that? Similar question for those surgically implanted. Yeah, so um, yes, absolutely. If you have a, a, a smallish shark and it's still in its growth phase and, and, and you put a, a bolter, a tag to, to its dorsal fin, you might um, distort the fin um, as it grows. So um, these tags that we have, they actually, they're designed to fall off. They're not designed to stay on long enough for that to happen. So that is, that is, a, that is an issue. Um, in terms of the, the internal tagging, I mean, I, I think any time that we, we interact physically with a shark, we're stressing the animal. And even, you know, even the, 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 the pole spear tagging, I've noticed it seems like they will, it, it bothers them enough to, to, to move off. And then you'll see them again swimming around. But it, there, is, there is an impact. But to give you some examples, um, just in November when we downloaded our data, um, we're still getting data from two or three silky sharks that we tagged back in 2012. And they've resided at the island. So I think, and, and that's those are internal tags. So yes, we're stressing them for a brief period, for a, for a question of minutes, but it doesn't appear to be changing their behavior in the long term. So I'm not sure if that completely answered your question. Oh, no, sorry, Alex, I think I, I did answer the question. Uh, thanks. The, as far as Cable had another question about traffickers in Hong Kong, the ones that were caught importing those shark fins, I'm really not sure what's going to happen to them. I have uh, started a dialogue with the director of the uh, Hong Kong Shark Foundation. So as soon as we get um, information from that part of the world and what's going on, we'll be sure to share that. Uh, Stu asks, uh, interesting about unique whale sharks in Galapagos, doesn't imply there may be other locations around the world that we haven't found yet. Can't believe that Galapagos is the only place. Of course, there are other places, as Alex indicated, uh, from the eastern Pacific all the way from Mexico down to the Galapagos and other parts of the world. Um, yeah, it was interesting. Actually found in in uh, St. Helena, uh, off, um, off the coast of, off the uh, west coast of Africa, um, they, they've got a, 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 a another unique situation where they've got 50-50 adults 
so 50% males and females. Um, and there's some there's some anecdotal reports of mating. I mean, so and, and again, this is an offshore island. So I think I, I think you're right. I think we may find that Galapagos is not unique. It's just the first example where we've really done a lot of research at an offshore location. Yep. Um, Ryan has a question. What are the, some of the next steps? Uh, I, I'll stab at this. You know, as Alex indicated, we're supposed to be on on uh, shark water right now uh, for our big uh, expedition between Cocos and the Galapagos, because the idea is to collect enough uh, data um, in that region to justify the protection of the shark swimway between Cocos and the Galapagos. Unfortunately, that's been tabled, and so we are looking for support. The plan is to do that expedition next year this time, so a year from now. So our planning will begin for next year. So anyone that wants to support us in that area, please contact me. My email is simple. It's alex at finsattached.org. Um, but beyond, beyond that, I also want to make, make sure I mention, you know, sit, conducting citizen scientist trips in the Galapagos is problematic, so we're not doing that. But we do offer um, citizen scientists research expeditions at Cocos Island. So, you know, anyone interested in joining us on an expedition to find out more details about what we're doing and be involved in the process, then you know, you're welcome to contact me for that as well. Uh, Scuba Steve, thank you for your great presentation. Erica, is Galapagos considered? considering growing the marine park area. Will you touch on that, Alex? You want to reiterate that? Well, the, the, the vice president of Ecuador um, about a year ago did um, publicly um, state that it, it's something that should be looked into. Um, and I think the president ratified that um, uh, over in, in, in Europe earlier this year towards the end of last year. So it's something that's, that's, um, that's on the cards, um, but no, uh, nothing concrete yet, um, but like like Alex said, you know this this area between the the, the, the swimway is also an area um, that, that, that could be looked at. Um, Sherry joined 15 minutes late. Sorry, you covered this. Is COVID affecting scheduled dive trips right now? We're scheduled to come from Colorado in July. Um, we're uh, you know, it is affecting dive trips. <laughs> there are none going on right now because the national parks in Costa Rica and in Galapagos are closed right now. So, so it is significantly affecting uh, Cocos. Uh, well, Costa Rica has indicated they're going to be opening their national parks, partially opening as they move forward uh, with international travel resuming right now as it stands on June 15th, but we'll see that may change. What's the status in the Galapagos and Ecuador, uh, Alex? Well, Galapagos is really hurting, uh, and I think I think it really highlights the fact that Galapagos depends so much on its tourism, um, and, and and part of that is shark tourism. Again, it highlights the need to protect the sharks, uh, but but yeah, it's it, people in Galapagos are in, in a lot of trouble right now because there's no income. No one, no one's getting any. Any source of income. Yeah. Um, we're hoping that it can open up as soon as possible, but I don't think there's any firm dates. We're hoping to get out there to do a research trip in July. We're hoping that by then we'll be able to. Um, but yeah, I would encourage any of you if you have plans to go to Galapagos, um, don't cancel. Just postpone until you can. But um, uh, you know, support the people on the islands that are that are struggling right now. Yeah, and I was uh, on a call with Randall, who's a, who's. I think he's still connected with us, and he was telling me about the the pressure from tourism because you know Costa Rica is also hurting quite a bit because they rely so much on tourism. So uh, you know, a lot of pressure from the tourist industry on the governments to open up uh, so that their people can go back to work and start earning money. Are there any economic studies that can argue for increasing the MPA? Or is fishing worth too much to government? Oh, there's a. I think there's a. There's a huge argument for that. Uh, we did a study about a year and a half ago um, where we analysed all the um, the large purse sailing vessels 
and their catch period effort went up since the creation of the marine reserve. They're fishing the line, so they're all, you know, one of the reasons the marine reserve was created is because industrial fishing was just going on right you know, by, by the shore. Um, and when they were pushed out to 40 nautical miles, um, they were very unhappy about it, but they're actually earning more money per set now than they were 20 years ago. Um, so that's, that's huge. Um, I'm not saying that it's the be all or end all for tuna because you know this is a huge tuna stock, uh, but what, what it probably is happening is that um, it's an area, a recruitment area. So the tuna that are there are just getting that chance to grow a little bit bigger before they're caught. And so they're heavier, so they're worth more. Um, and that, so, so we know that the current size already helped. Um, I think there would be an argument for, for increasing in certain areas, especially because what we're finding now is that these large foreign fleets, um, maybe they've exhausted their own supplies of fish, and they're now on the border of our EEC, really kind of aggressively uh, fishing our stocks. And so, um, and, and that's likely to happen more and more as, as the oceans change with climate change. So I, I think we, we need to, um, we, we need to do those studies and, and, and see how best we can secure, you know, at least our national fishing industry, rather than just have everything spill out and be caught by a foreign fleet that doesn't really take care of its resources. Um, almost see no hotspots for shark activity. One second up is unique. Um, seamounts tend to be areas that are that, that, that have high kind of or, or higher biomass than the surrounding areas. Um, there's num a number of reasons for that. I mean, one is the fact that you get localized upwelling because the currents kind of shift water upwards. Uh, one is that they provide kind of refuge. They provide structure in the water column. I mean, you could argue that the entire Galapagos platform is one big seamount almost. So um, yeah, I think gen generally they uh, they tend to have uh, you know animals tend to aggregate around seamounts. I think the fact that Galapagos has such high density is partly the fact that it's been well protected uh, in relation to, to seamounts that are closer to shore. And there's also it an also yeah, sorry it also, it also sit the confluence of three major currents. So I mean it, it, it's pretty uniquely situated as well. Yeah, and also um, we're also learning more about the seamounts around Cocos, which are outside of the protected area, which are also important uh, shark hotspots, um, West Cocos, La Cimelas, and potentially even East Cocos. So that was part of our, that was part of what we were supposed to be studying right now. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't make it out there, but there are, so I, you know, Randall has already collected some uh, data of, Hammerheads at Cocos go into Las Imelas and back. So to, to be able to collect more and more data of those shark movements uh, around those seamounts and then eventually connecting Cocos and the Galapagos, I think it's going to be incredibly important information to, to try to convince governments to create that protected swimway. Uh, what else here? Oh, Alex, you, you know, uh, Anders is asking if that's a Marmite mug that you got there. <laughs> it is, it is. They should, they should sponsor me. Because this is, this is my mug. No one else in the house is allowed to touch it. <laughs> oh. No one else would want to either, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think our, our hour is up. I uh, really appreciate everyone uh, attending. Great questions. Uh, thank you for your positive feedback. Um, this has been recorded, so for those that came in late or left early, uh, we'll be posting that online in the next week or so, so you'll be able to go watch it in its entirety. Thank you so much, Alex, for taking the time, for giving us a, a great presentation. Uh, if anyone wants to reach out to me, again, my email is alex at finsattached.org, quite simple. And then subscribe to our e-newsletter, and we'll keep you posted that way as well through our website. Thanks everyone, enjoy the rest of your evening and have a great weekend coming up and stay safe and be well.